They've been around since the time of dinosaurs. And today they endure as one of nature's most resilient survivors. Swimming huge distances in the face of natural predators and unnatural threats. It's a lifelong struggle against odds that are getting tougher all the time. Making sea turtles miraculous superstars in this edition of Saving a Species. Welcome to Saving a Species. I'm Bill Street, and you're about to meet one of nature's top survivors, the sea turtle. To help us fully appreciate these amazing animals, we've put together a top team of experts who aren't going to just introduce us to sea turtles. We're going to try to experience a little bit of what life looks like from a sea turtle's perspective. Let's start with Chuck Caro, who's joining us from Fort DeSoto Beach on Florida's Gulf Coast. Hey Bill, this stretch of beach is a known sea turtle nesting area and fortunately it's also a protected wildlife area. So park rangers do an amazing job of guarding the nest and ensuring turtle survival. But even with all of that, sea turtles face some pretty tough odds, especially at the nesting stage. So we wondered what could happen to a sea turtle's nest during the course of 48 hours. To find out, we set up a simulated nest monitored by a hidden time-lapse camera. Whatever happens, we'll show you the results later in the show. Thanks, Chuck. And now it's time to meet some sea turtles up close. For that, we turn to Aquarius Tim and Nate. Hi, I'm Tim. And I'm Nate. And we're here to talk turtles. Sea turtles! Okay. Let's talk about the first thing that everyone focuses on. I'll say turtle, you say shell. Exactly. If I were to wear this to a party, no one would have to guess at my costume. Hey, you're a turtle. The problem is, when people think of a turtle shell, they tend to think of this. To be sure, a sea turtle shell does provide them with some natural protection, but it doesn't make them invincible. For starters, there's one huge difference between land turtles and sea turtles. Most land or terrestrial turtles can withdraw inside their shell for protection. Not so with the sea turtle. They're built for a life spent full time in the water. And with flippers instead of legs, the limbs stay fixed outside of the shell. It's the same thing with sea turtles' heads, non-retractable. All this helps to make them great swimmers, but also makes them more vulnerable than their land-bound relatives. But sea turtles aren't just different from land turtles, they're also different from each other. You know, some folks think there's only one type of sea turtle, but that's not really true. You've got your loggerhead sea turtle, your leatherback sea turtles, and then there's the Ridleys. Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, Olive Ridley sea turtle. I'm kind of partial to the green sea turtle. You've got your hawksbill sea turtle, your flatback sea turtle. Did I mention the loggerhead sea turtle? Yes, yes you did. Sea turtles do come in several different varieties with some important differences. You can kind of think of it as if you were choosing a character from a video game. Okay, I'm gonna select green sea turtle. If you look at the design of the shell, the top side of the shell is called a carapace. That's right. If you look at the carapace, you'll notice all these cool hexagonal plates. Those are called scoots. Correct. And the carapace with all those scoots creates a very hard shell. But check this out. This is the leatherback. This guy doesn't have scoots at all. Instead, he's got ridges. Also, the carapace is softer. Like leather. Now, if you were choosing your turtle for body armor, you'd probably pick the hard shell of the green sea turtle, right? Right. But not so fast. The reason the leatherback's carapace is different is that it's really thick and provides excellent insulation. This lets the leatherback travel to much colder waters than other sea turtles. And the leatherback is the largest of all the sea turtles. They can get as big as 70 inches, around 2,000 pounds. But then look at this. The Olive Ridleys, they're the smallest of the sea turtles. Only about 20 to 30 inches and around 100 pounds. Huge difference there. Also, each of the sea turtle species has their own unique adaptations. Like the hawksbill turtle. 
This guy's got a narrow head and a hawk-like beak that he uses for picking food like sponges from narrow crevices and coral reefs. That's a very cool profile. Hey, just thinking, we're talking a lot about the differences. We probably ought to talk about what sea turtles have in common. You know what that means. Yeah, it's time to go prehistoric. Toys, Tim, really? Hey, come on, it works. Scientists believe that modern sea turtles came from Martian-habiting ancestors from the late Triassic period. The largest was around 6,000 pounds. Over the years, these cold-blooded, hard-shelled reptiles shrunk down in size and became the sea turtles that we know and love today. And here they are, the modern sea turtles. The bones in their flippers are a lot like what you'd find in your own hand. Just imagine if your hand was turned into a flipper. There's only one or two claws on each front flipper. And it's the front flippers that provide all the swimming power. The hind flippers are much shorter. They act like rudders, allowing the animal to swim in the desired direction. And the hind flippers are very good for digging in the sand, which is very useful when nesting season comes around. 41,000, 42,000, 43,000, 44... <gasps> the average human can hold their breath for only about a minute. Sea turtles can hold their breath for hours. It's not just that sea turtles can hold their breath a long time. As cold-blooded animals, they can actually slow their metabolic rate. Their heart rate slows to conserve oxygen so they can stay in the water longer. Some sea turtles can actually hibernate through winter underwater. What little oxygen they do need comes directly from the water. Dissolved oxygen taken directly through their skin. Enough about sea turtles. Tim, you gotta work on your lung capacity. Ready, go! One 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000. With natural threats all around, sea turtles have been beating the odds for millions of years. But as you're about to see, modern threats make the odds tougher than ever. To understand the plight of the sea turtle, you have to know the numbers, so take a look. I have calculated survival rates of sea turtles. Now, I'm gonna take that data, plot it into a graph to illustrate numeric odds. All right, who am I kidding? This is boring. I've got a better idea. Why don't we use this giant crowd to demonstrate? Are you guys ready? Yeah! yeah! We've given all these participants color-coded stickers, but up to now, we haven't told them what the colors signify. Okay, everybody, for today's demonstration, you're all gonna be sea turtles! Yeah! Each of you has a colored sticker that represents a certain stage in the life of a sea turtle. If I call out your color, I'm gonna tell you what that means, and then I'm gonna ask you to leave the group. You got it? All right, pink stickers. Now the mother sea turtle laid a bunch of eggs and this whole group represents that 100%, but the pink stickers, you're the 20% that didn't even hatch. Get out of there. When I first saw the other groups going off, I thought maybe I'm gonna survive. Okay, now the white stickers. The good news is you hatched. Yay, you're a hatchling. The bad news is you're part of the 50% that fell prey to predators like raccoons, and seagulls, and crabs. You didn't make it. Bye. When I heard my color being called, I was really quite upset because I wanted to be a surviving turtle. All right, where's my yellow stickers? Hey, congratulations! You made it from the nest all the way to the water. But remember, you're just an itty bitty sea turtle and you didn't quite make the swim to protective cover. Sorry, you're gonna have to go. All right, blue group, congratulations. You've made it pretty far. You've reached adulthood. But don't celebrate too much because it's a big, huge ocean and there's predators out there. You didn't make it either. And now for the green stickers. You guys are pretty tough, right? Yeah, but you forgot about the human factor. I'm talking about beach development, habitat destruction, pollution, fishing nets, fishing lines. You're gone. And the purple sticker. Now of our original group, that 100%, you are the surviving 1%. Congratulations. You made it. Realizing that such a low percent of sea turtles live was really crazy. To know that such a low percentage of them actually survive is very devastating. Only about 1% of the eggs that are laid in a sea turtle nest survive. For the most part, when sea turtles are laying their eggs on the beach, that's where the danger really starts. So check it out. This stretch of beach is a well-known sea turtle nesting area. But what's unusual about it, it's a public beach, but it's also a county park. Hello. 
So park rangers are able to identify the nest early on and guard them with protective barriers just like this. Here's why that protection is so important. When a turtle digs its nest, it'll dig a deep hole for the eggs to drop into, and then it's going to carefully cover up the hole. Then the nest is left unprotected until the hatchlings emerge. To find out what could happen to an unprotected nest, we've designed a small experiment. First, we've identified a natural nesting area. Next, we dug three holes of our own, simulating actual turtle nests. To make the nest as real as possible, we placed fresh chicken eggs in each hole. So now, it's time for the hidden cameras. Come on, man, tell me what's going on. We got three cameras, one up in the tree, two on the ground, all equipped with night vision capabilities. So if a human or a predator was to come near, we should be able to capture it all on film. The question is, what will become of our nest within a 48-hour period? We'll find out in a minute. But first, let's look at what happens to the turtles that do make it out of the nest. So, think about it. You've just broken out of your shell, you're shaking off all the sand, and now you're ready for your first swim. But then comes the welcoming party! <laughs> Little hatchlings are easy pickings for birds, raccoons, crabs, and just about any predator with a taste for turtle. For the hatchlings that do make it to the sea, they kind of disappear into the unknown. They actually head offshore for habitats that are basically floating rafts of seaweed well offshore. Surviving young sea turtles will eventually swim farther out, but what happens next is pretty intense. So check it out. Imagine you're a sea turtle just minding your own business, swimming along, blub, 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 and then BAM! It's as if I was kind of caught up in a really strong gust of wind. Only for the sea turtles, they're often caught up in a powerful offshore current. And once they're caught up in this current, it's a wild ride. Sea turtles travel these currents on migrations that can cover thousands of ocean miles. Okay, now take a look at this. It's data on a single green sea turtle. We'll call her Turtle X. Over the years, scientists have tracked sea turtles like Turtle X. And while these coordinates might seem a little bit dry, let's take a look and see what happens when we bring those numbers to life. Turtle X started here on the southeast coast. From there, she swam to the Azores. Her total round trip journey ends up being kind of like if you walk from New York to Los Angeles and back again. Now, without a doubt, it's a remarkable migration, but none of it can take place if the turtles don't make it past the nest. Let's take a look and see what's happening with our simulated nest experiment. For the first couple of hours, our nest remain undisturbed, but then the human activity begins to pick up. At first, it's just a few close calls, and then, wait for it, wait for it, oof. It looks like that person just walked right on top of our nest area. If that's true, let's hope the covering of sand will protect the delicate eggs from the weight above. Now, if this was just one isolated incident, perhaps our nest would be spared. But during the course of our 48-hour test, a large number of people walked unwittingly right on top of our unmarked nest. You can only imagine what's happening to the eggs below. As the sun goes down, we're fully prepared for an even bigger threat to egg survival, nocturnal predators such as raccoons and crabs. I was camped out nearby the nests and I could hear the raccoons around me, but I never actually saw them come near the nest. Our Nest 3 camera did catch this one crab nibbling around a bit, but that's the extent of predator activity. However, come day two, the humans are out in full force and all over nest one and two. Only nest three, built farther into the seagrass, goes completely untouched. Now, as we excavate the nest, we're anticipating that we're probably going to come across some losses here. Let's check this out. Look at here. This is an egg intact. Now, that's a really good thing. Really good thing. Oh, yeah. Look at this. Can you see that? Yeah, definitely some losses here. Not good, not good at all. Well, it's only been 48 hours and, and this is what's happened, so it kind of gives you an idea what would happen over a multi-week period. Again, this particular beach is a county park. An actual nest would have been identified and protected. It shows that having more wildlife refuges like this one is vital if we're to help sea turtles overcome the odds against them. Now, in carrying out our first experiment, we came up with a whole other question, and that is, What's it like for a sea turtle to crawl from the shore to the nest? Well, there's only one way to find out, and that's to be a sea turtle. I'll explain when we come back. Young sea turtles are highly vulnerable to predators and human threats, but they're also susceptible to weather. In the winter of 2010, a prolonged period of extreme cold threatened the survival of hundreds of sea turtles in Florida. 
avoiding all-out disaster would require the kind of effort and dedication that can only be described as heroic. As Aquarius, we spend a lot of time around pools just like these. Ordinarily, we deal with a pretty steady influx of sick and injured marine animals. But not too long ago, we experienced a situation that was anything but ordinary. Imagine these same pools filled with cold stunned sea turtles. I'm talking turtles everywhere. More turtles than we thought we'd ever see in a lifetime, and each one in need of critical care. It all started when a wave of frigid Arctic air caused air and water temperatures to drop for nearly two weeks in a row. Hundreds of sea turtles began washing up along Florida beaches in a state of cold stress, which is a potentially deadly condition. When it first started early January, we got one turtle in. And then the next day we got two turtles in. And after that, we were getting 50, 60, 70 turtles a day. What was happening was as these animals were showing up on beaches, volunteers were walking the beaches and they'd find these animals and they would literally bring them by the truckload. A lot of people were finding these stranded sea turtles in the inshore lagoon areas of Florida. A few turtles started coming in, which didn't really surprise us too much, but then a few more turtles came in and then a few trucks came in. It really became a big operation very quickly. Cold stunned sea turtle means that the internal body temperature of the turtle has dropped very dramatically. The turtle becomes slow and lethargic, they'll float on the surface of the water, and they basically shut down all their natural body processes. In this event, we saw juvenile green sea turtles, and then we also saw very large adult sea turtles that we normally wouldn't see in this time frame. It was unbelievable. I don't think I've ever seen that many sea turtles in my entire life. When the turtles first come in and they're cold, they can't move around very well, they can't lift their heads up to breathe. We housed these animals, tried to warm up their systems through heating lamps and blankets, and once their temperatures reached a normal level, they were allowed to enter a water environment, and we monitored their eating, if they were swimming well. Even though most of the sea turtles were simply cold stunned, uh, you know, some of them had more severe injuries that needed extra critical care. The first two weeks, we didn't take any days off at all. We were just here all the time. We were kind of working around the clock in shifts just to manage all the sea turtles that were coming in. We would work about 15, 16 hour days some days and wake up and do it again the next day. We normally we have a few people that are dedicated to sea turtles, you know, 24 seven, 365 days a year. But in this case, we needed all hands on deck. We had other departments like our maintenance department, our water quality department. They were dropping whatever they were doing and come over helping us build aquariums, plumb aquariums, run electrical. Some of the tasks that you don't think about that are essential, as, as mundane as they are, is like doing a lot of laundry. The amount of laundry that's needed for 300 turtles is a lot. They get stinky after a day or two, so those towels and tarps had to be changed every day. I think everyone that stepped in to help us was very excited to get more hands-on with the animals, and uh, we were so grateful to have that extra help. On release day, it's time to load up all the turtles into the truck. We released a whole semi-truck full of turtles within one morning. Releasing that many animals, uh, generally when we release one sea turtle, it's very important and very rewarding. So when you release 40 in one day, uh, it's amazing. The first wave of turtles that we released in Juneau Beach uh, was a very festive event. You're in the middle of it and you're going and going, you stop and look around and you see all these people helping you. It kind of makes you stop and look and you're like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. The upside of this incident was that we got to tag a lot of sea turtles that we would have never gotten to tag before. It gave a great deal of information as to where turtles are this time of year, where they might go, and in the future if we encounter them, uh, where they've been and a history on them. When all these sea turtles were coming in, it was a challenge, and we felt, you know, an obligation and a responsibility to help these animals. Any sea turtle we can save is going to help the population recover. This was probably one of the most memorable events in my career. As a whole team, we saw that we could really do a lot. It was just such a great feeling to see all these people coming together and, you know, putting these turtles back in a natural environment. It was a tremendous effort. In a two-month period, approximately 300 sea turtles were rescued, rehabbed, and released by this group of people. A truly phenomenal event. It's an incredible story. 
And again, all the turtles released were tagged for future tracking. They'll provide information critical to the scientific study of these amazing animals. And now let's return to the beach where Chuck Caro shows us a turtle eye view of the miraculous journey back to the nesting grounds. After many years at sea, it's time for this adult to return home and make new sea turtles. Easy, right? So anyone who's ever set up a couple of chairs on the beach can definitely relate to this next challenge. You go out for a nice swim, but you forget that you're floating with the current. And then suddenly, you're looking like crazy trying to find your spot on the beach. I know it's around here somewhere. You're disoriented after floating a couple hundred yards. Sea turtles, on the other hand, travel halfway around the world and have to find a home stretch of shoreline they haven't seen since they were hatchlings. No one is 100% sure how the sea turtles get back to the same beach that they hatched on. They travel thousands and thousands of miles and yet they still end up in the same place they left. It could be sensitivity to magnetic fields, but somehow they have their GPS on and they get right back to the same spot where they started. Once the sea turtles do find their way back, males and females will mate in the waters offshore. The male's job is done, but the female sea turtle still has a final turtle hurdle. A creature weighing several hundred pounds and built for sea travel now has to crawl from the waterline to the nesting area. Sometimes that can be quite a haul. And to help illustrate that challenge, we've enlisted the help of four high school students, Hayden, Dan, Monica, and Evie. Are you guys ready for this? Yeah! You are ready for this, but first off, we're gonna need you to put on your turtle backpacks. We'll go ahead and put them on. Now this is gonna help simulate the weight and inflexibility of an actual sea turtle shell. All right, guys, looking good, looking good. Now get this. Imagine, if you will, that you're a female sea turtle. You imagining that? Yeah, I am. Okay, now you've just swum thousands of miles, but now you've got to make it from the shoreline all the way up to the nesting area. You've got to do that, but not with your legs. Lay down on the ground, belly down. All four of you, come on, belly down. All the way down. Now, on your mark, get set, go! And they're off, like a bunch of turtles. When I was told that we would have to crawl on our bellies all the way up there, I thought, you know, not that far. But I was dead wrong. Kind of tough, huh? And the good news is you're not even halfway there. With the weight of the turtle shell, I could barely move at all. I mean, crawling up the beach like that. And it looks like Hayden has taken a lead, but Dan is not too far behind him, just by a flipper. It was tougher than I expected it would be. Push, come on, give it all you got. You got tired about halfway up the beach. I really didn't think I was going to make it. You got it, Evie. It worked every muscle in your body. Really hard. I don't know how turtles do this. Four years of band camp couldn't even compare to this. Woo! Oh. All right, great job, guys. It looks like Hayden was the first one to make it to the nesting ground. Normally, I would say that he's the winner of this turtle marathon, but you're not done yet. Sea turtles have to dig their nest using only their hind flippers. When Chuck told us that we had to dig a hole with our feet, I was kind of shocked. I thought he was kidding. I really didn't think he was going to make us dig a hole with our feet, but he did. I can't believe how long it took me to dig out that hole. It hurt my feet so much. It was much more challenging than I expected it to be. I can't even imagine how turtles would do this every year. Looks like we got ourselves a winner. All right, great job, team, but it looks like our nest digging champion today is Evie. <laughs> and the rest of y'all were pretty good. But now I've got a question for all of y'all. Seriously, who has a newfound appreciation for sea turtles? Well, I don't think we're going to have any annual sea turtle crawl marathons, but we did do what we set out to do. I think everyone's got a better understanding of just how tough and tenacious sea turtles really are. As we've seen, sea turtles face tough odds no matter what. But now, with so many humans encroaching in sea turtle feeding and nesting areas, the odds could be just about impossible. Julie Scardina joins us to show how humans could be the ruin or salvation of endangered sea turtles. The beaches of Nicaragua provide prime nesting areas for sea turtles, but many beaches are far from safe havens. 
We're on the beach in Nicaragua. We've been here all night. It's eight o'clock in the morning and the hatchlings are still coming out. This is a brand new nest, probably a hundred, over a hundred eggs in there. And all these little guys are trying to make it to the ocean. To keep these hatchlings away from hungry daytime predators, we'll protect them for now and then release them once night falls. This should at least give them a fighting chance. However, here in Nicaragua, as in many beaches around the world, natural predators are only part of the problem. With so much poverty and hunger in the world, sea turtles and their eggs are frequently harvested illegally in a practice called poaching. I was selected as an ambassador for the SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Conservation Fund to work with Fauna and Flora here in Nicaragua. We are going to the different communities and teaching the kids about the importance of not eating eggs and not poaching sea turtles. Yuritza goes from school to school, sharing a message she hopes will spread from the kids out to the entire community. Though as her experience in one remote village makes clear, the message of saving sea turtles might be a tough sell. We were there and we were asking them, what do you know about sea turtles? The only responses that I got from this community school were, oh, we eat the eggs. Oh, they're good. They're better than chicken eggs. Or their meat, it's amazing. It's better than fish. To counter these traditional views, Yuritza shares the plight of endangered sea turtles. She provides information about other food sources that offer viable alternatives to poaching. You can tell in the kids' eyes at the end of the workshop, honestly, from the heart, apologizing for eating eggs and promising you that they're not gonna do it in the future. Education in third world countries such as Nicaragua can make a huge difference. However, back home, the need for increased awareness is just as critical. Here in the U.S., poaching isn't as much of an issue, but human encroachment is. Consider these beach homes and condos all a source of distracting and harmful artificial light to sea turtles. When we have lots of lights along the beaches, the baby sea turtles that are hatching out at night are confused. They go towards the lights instead of the ocean, where they can be run over by cars or eaten by predators. If the lights weren't there, they could have made it to the beach and perhaps made it into the ocean more safely. Our love of water and our proximity to beaches creates all kinds of unintended hazards. Beachgoers unknowingly trample invisible turtle nests, and then some leave litter. See this plastic bag floating in the water? To a sea turtle, this looks like a tasty jellyfish. And plastic caught in the digestive tract of a sea turtle is a known killer. Then there's entanglement. Discarded fishing line can easily ensnare, cripple, and even drown a sea turtle. The human threats here are different from in Nicaragua. But just like in third world countries, the solution comes with education. And you can play a big part. When somebody asks you, paper or plastic? Tell them you brought your own. And if you're fishing, make sure you keep the cut line with you. Never toss monofilament line overboard and use the fishing line recycling bins that are found on public docks, piers, and marinas. And if you happen to be strolling a beach, you can always be on the lookout for litter. Even if you just pick up a few stray pieces, your action could make all the difference in the life of a sea turtle. Not near a beach? Well, trash has a habit of traveling, from land to rivers and out to sea. So no matter where you live, you can still be on the lookout. You can still make a difference. Now let's turn back to our experts for a quick recap, what we call our Saving the Species Wild Round. Each expert has exactly 15 seconds to give a final overview of their top content takeaways. Remember, 15 seconds, starting now. Sea turtles, they're amazing creatures that have been around for millions of years, fascinating in the way that they are adapted specifically for living in all the oceans of the world, yet for the first time in history, they are threatened by extinction and need our help more than ever. Sea turtles are amazing and resilient animals. When they're in their nests and when they're hatchlings, they face land predators like raccoons and seagulls and crabs. Once they hit the water, they are not home free. There's predators there as well. If they make it to adulthood, they have to swim thousands and thousands of miles just to mate. And we haven't even begun to talk about the human factors. Sea turtles are cold-blooded animals. They're very susceptible to colder temperatures. This is where man has to come in and help them out. But they are very well adapted to the marine environment. They can get up to 2,000 pounds. They can hold their breath for hours on end. They have a shell for protection, and they travel vast distances in the ocean. Today we've learned about sea turtle populations and their incredible journeys from the nest to the sea and back again. We also saw some of the threats endangering sea turtles and what we can do to help improve their chances of survival. 
Of course, we've just touched on the surface of what there is to know. To learn more about sea turtles and other incredible animals, visit ShamuTV.com. We'll post activities, games, and behind the scenes videos to help inspire you to make a difference in the lives of sea turtles. Until next time, I'm Bill Street, saying thanks for watching and for your part in saving a species.